you looking for a different level of truth about your challenges and struggles? Then be a part of the Yes And podcast, hosted by empowerment strategist and trauma specialist, Jennifer Whitaker. Every Wednesday, we challenge conventional thinking on topics like trauma, healing, and so much more. Learn life lessons and great nuggets of wisdom from guests who've moved through their pain and suffering to discover a new purpose in life. Now, here's your host, Jennifer Whitaker. Hi, everyone. This is Jennifer Whitaker, and you are watching another episode of Yes And. And I'm really excited for today's guest on Yes And. Um, I have Lena Sisko with us here today. And Lena is a former Naval Intelligence Officer, and she is a Department of Defense Certified Interrogator. Um, I met Lena three years ago when I did my first class in body language through the Body Language Institute, and Lena teaches for them as well. Um, Since 2003, Lena has been training the government, military, law enforcement, um, and the private sector in techniques on interviewing, interrogation, body language, detecting deception, elicitation, leadership, and enhanced communication skills. Um, And I also know that Lena loves animals, um, which is another thing that we have in common. And I'm really excited to have her on the show today. And I will make sure, because Lena is also an author and a TEDx speaker, and I'll make sure that I put links to her book and um, TEDx talk in the show notes. So Lena, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Welcome. Thank you. And thank you for having me. Oh, I'm, I'm really glad to have you here today. Um, so I, I'm imagining that when people see you, uh, they're having a hard time getting their head around you being a naval intelligence officer and a certified interrogator. And I know for a fact that you've um, interrogated Al-Qaeda. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your career, you know, just to let the audience know who you are? Sure. Um, It it is a story because where I am today was completely unexpected and unplanned. Um, Growing up, I just wanted to be an archaeologist. I watched Indiana Jones. Of course, I fell in love with him because who didn't, right? Um, And I thought, I want to travel the world and I love culture and I just wanted to experience all that adventure. So I determined, or was determined, to become an archaeologist, and I did. And I got my master's in it, and I got to dig overseas, and it was amazing. Um, I was in Tuscany in Greece and digging up Roman ruins. It was amazing. But the thing was, is that something still wasn't clicking. When I came back from my second dig, I thought, wow, look at the life I'm leading right now. Look at what I'm doing. I'm doing what I always wanted to do, but I don't feel completely satisfied. And I kept asking myself, why not? What's wrong with me, right? This is what I wanted to do. So I had a good friend in my hometown, and he said, you know, because I didn't have a job after getting my master's degree at Brown. He's like, you know, you could join the the Navy Reserves and get some extra money because they'll pay you. And I thought, join the military? Are you kidding me? I'm like, "Um, no, that's never in my plan. I would never want to do that. Why would I do that? So every so often, every time we get together and go out, he would tell me a little bit more about what it entailed. And I don't know, somewhere along the line, I got hooked and I got curious. And he was in naval intelligence and he's like, well, think of James Bond. If you can't be Indiana Jones, you could be James Bond. And I thought, oh, okay, maybe. It still sounds adventurous, right, and a challenge. And I still wanted to go see the world and travel. So I said, "Eh, what the heck? And he got me into a uh, recruiting office, and I signed on the dotted line, and I came in as a pending E3, which is very low on the totem pole, and I didn't even care because I didn't really know what that meant. And I thought, cool, whatever, and I signed on for a six-year contract. Uh, It turned into 11 years only because at the point I was at, I got commissioned um, as an officer along the way, and I loved what I did as an interrogator best thing I've ever done in my life. And that's when I started doing something that resonated with me. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is what I'm meant to do on this planet. Mm -hmm. It's to help people. It's to put bad people away and get the truth and protect good people. And I thought, bam, this is it. And I'm a people person. Um, Being an interrogator was very much like being an archaeologist because as I'm going through stories and putting all these pieces of the puzzle together, I'm still using that analytical brain that I love um, when I was doing uh, intelligence work. 
So all of this stuff, like being an intel officer and an archaeologist, is very analytical. And of course, it's dealing with people. I love working with people. I love animals too. But I thought I finally found my niche. When I got trained, um, I got trained by the Marine Corps. And I didn't think I was going to make it through their training because they're pretty tough. And I thought, oh my gosh, every week that we went to class, I thought I'm going to get dropped. They're going to kick me out. But I don't know, for some, somehow it clicked and I loved it and I loved the challenge. And then I graduated and thought, when am I going to use it? And then lo and behold, 9 11 happened. It was a year and a half after my training. And then off I went to Gitmo. And that just, the time I spent in Gitmo is a lifetime of experiences. And I write about some of them in my first book. Mm-hmm. But I learned so much of a technique that I train today, which is a non accusatory strategic interviewing technique. And I train all of law enforcement. Mm-hmm. My course is actually certified by the Department of Criminal Justice in Virginia. So all law enforcement personnel attending can get credit, um, time and service credit. And we are expanding. So I have taught in North Carolina and in New York, and we're hoping to take over the United States one day. But um, it is a, a method that I started using while at Gitmo because I thought there's got to be something that attracts a person uh, enough that they want to be able to talk to you, they want to trust you, and they want to tell you the truth. Mm-hmm. And so I was, you know, I got trained in a whole bunch of approach techniques, some of which I thought were just absolutely ridiculous to use because all it created was defensiveness and made people very angry. And why would I want that? Right. Um, so I came up with kind of my own technique. And for all those times, I've conducted hundreds and hundreds of interrogations and interviews. I still do them to this day. Um, I developed a, a technique that I find extremely useful. It's never failed me. And so that's kind of what I what I teach other people in. Yeah, and I have found your technique to be really useful because it was it was three years ago when we met when I was at Janine's class at the Body Language Institute. And I remember when you came in to teach your segment of the class, I think it was a three hour segment. Um, I, I, I got frustrated, not because of what you were teaching, because I couldn't keep up writing down what you were saying. I was trying to hang on to every word. I'm like, this is good stuff. I'm like, holy crap. It was one of my favorite parts of that whole week or weekend or that whole class. One of my favorite parts. Thank you. Thank you so yeah. much. I'm actually yeah. gonna be training um, a couple of students virtually tomorrow for her. Awesome. <laughs> yep. Awesome. Yeah. And, and the training that I've received in body language has absolutely been life altering and life changing in how I communicate with others. And even more importantly, in how I see myself. Yeah. And I'm wondering, did you have that as well? Did you notice a difference in how you communicate with others from all of this training? And can you talk to that a little bit? Oh, huge, huge difference. When I took Janine's class, the Train the Trainer class, it was, I think it's like, it's either six or seven years ago now. Mm -hmm. I was already considered an expert in detecting deception and body language. I mean, I've been doing it for decades. Mm -hmm. I was teaching people in it. But something told me, I'm... My motto is always remain a student. So you constantly have got to be learning. No matter life skills, interpersonal communication skills, leadership, your uh, special technical expertise, whatever it is, always learn, learn, learn. Um, And so at that point, I felt a little stagnant. And I was like, okay, I know what I know. Now I need to go find out what I don't know. And I want to hear it from somebody who doesn't have a background like I do. I've gotten all the training from military and, you know, interrogation stuff and all that. Now I want something a little different. I want something with the private sector because I felt at that time that I had a skill that was so applicable to the private sector and to, you know, everyday civilians that I thought I need to be sharing this, these techniques with them. How do I go about doing it? I just want to point out to our listeners because I talk a lot about um, how the mindset where we get stuck in judgment and the antidote to judgment is curiosity. So please listen to what this woman is saying about her approach to life. I got stagnant. I needed to know what I didn't know. Get curious about your lives because that's how you keep moving forward and that's how you get out of that judgment and the judgment causes suffering inside of yourself. So please like notice some of these things as she's talking. <laughs> that was brilliant. I love hearing that from you. 
Um, mm -hmm. And when I hear that from other people, it keeps my battery charged. Mm -hmm. like, even when, because I get frustrated like everybody else. And there's some yeah. days I'm like, you know what? I I'm done. I I'm just, I'm going to end here. I don't know where to go. And I'm like, no, that's not the attitude to have. Mm -hmm. Just pause for a minute, give it a break, go play over here, think about it, come back to whatever it is. But mm -hmm. that challenge is also, you know, being willing to accept your failures. When I yes. fail, it doesn't bother me. It used to. When I was younger, oh my gosh, it would, it would affect my whole being and my health. Right but now, I'm like, you know what? I'm human, and if I'm not failing at something, I'm not learning good lessons from it. So it's a hard pill to swallow sometimes, but I toughen up. I'm like, all right, I'm going to accept this. I'm going to make something positive out of it. Mm -hmm. And it's just that willpower. So having no fear to take challenges, to risk everything, to try something new, and to keep learning. Right? Mm -hmm. I when I started right before I took Janine's training, I thought, okay, so I'm considered this expert. What if I fail out of her class? Like, what if I go to her, her class and I'm horrible? Oh, can I handle that? And I was like, don't think about that. Why would you even think about that right now, Lena? Just go to the class. Go to the class, you know, and, and see what happens. So I go to her class and, oh my gosh, she, she did exactly what military training does. And what I mean by that is she takes you, she's not just teaching body language. Um, and detecting deception. She is above and beyond that. She's teaching you leadership skills, whether you know it or not. She's teaching you how to be an amazing public speaker. She's teaching you how to find your self-confidence. She's teaching you not to be so self-critical, but to build that inner strength, um, to get in front of people, and really to go after your goals. Because my goal at that point was to create my own company. And I thought, I need Janine's training to be able to push me to be able to create, you know, establish my own company and take my training to the private sector because I can't do it on my own. I don't feel like I'm there. I need her help. And I knew she was the person because I had watched so many videos of her. I knew she was the person that was going to give me that little push. Um, and so in her class, I show up. I've been teaching for decades, so I feel I'm pretty good presenter, um, public speaking, and I'm pretty good in my technical expertise. But when I got there, within the first nine hours of her class, I was like, oh my God, I'm horrible. <laughs> I was like, wow, <laughs> what? So my ego just went poof, flattened out. And I was like, all right, let's take a breather for a minute. Let's find out what this, what, how did she get inside my head? You know, how did she do this? And I'll never forget, there was one um, exercise she did with us. And it was, uh, something about you had to convince her or um, be interesting in this topic, right? So, because we, she was preparing us to do keynote speaking events, and we had like two minutes to get this thing out. And I mean, it was like a round robin exercise. There was ten of us, and everybody came up for two minutes, and she'd kick you off. You'd be forty minutes. <laughs> she's like, "Stop! It sucks. Go, go, think about it, and redo it." And I'm like, uh, uh, "Right?" <laughs> and you go back I remember and that, <laughs> and you're like. I don't know, like, what do I do? Okay, I'll try this. You go up and you start, before you even open your mouth, she's like, mm, like body language, go, go think about it. And I'm like, <laughs> so she taught me so much about myself and how I come across to others and what I should do, what I shouldn't do, um, finding that inner confidence and relating it to what I want to talk about. I, it was just amazing. For those first couple of days, man, she just beat me down, beat me down just like the military does, only to build you back up again. And yep. so all of her training, which was back in the day when I went through, she was a little more hardcore. We had class from 9 to 9, sometimes 10 at night. That's how and the first round was when I went, was cool. the 9 to 9. Yeah. It yeah. was intense. intense. Yes. And, and then at night, we would have to do so much homework and come in with these videos of us and everything else, and then bam, 9 a.m., you're – all the way to nine or 10 at night again. Mm -hmm. Exhausted every day, working yeah. hard. With anyway, um, so she kind of beat me down to the point that I was like, now I'm ready to learn. What is, what is this woman gonna, gonna teach me about myself? She's not saying, Lena, you know, this is what you have to learn about yourself. She's saying, hey, get, you know, I tell people, get out of your head. Mm -hmm. Stop being so self-critical. Stop with the negative talk, self-talk. Stop thinking I can't. Just change your mindset. And that's what she did. She started to change our mindset to say, okay, I got this. 
Mm-hmm. I can do this. If they can do it, I can do it. And now she's given me this method to do it. I'll just put it together and I'll just do it, you know? And when you start doing that, you start climbing back up the ladder by the end of that class, you've read the light bulb comes on and you realize I had this within me the whole entire time. I just needed someone to bring it out. Yes, exactly. And I had a a similar experience in her class. Um, Only at the end of my experience, she didn't come to me and ask me to teach to be a part of her. (laughs) I know she did that with you. (laughs) She did. She did. Well, here's another funny thing, talking about challenging ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. I went to her class and, you know, at that point, she was like a celebrity to me. I was like, I'm going to meet Janine Driver. Oh my gosh. Same here. (laughs) Yes. Same here. I went into the class and I'll never forget, I told my friends, I'm like, you know what? My goal by the end of this course, number one, obviously to learn something that I don't know, but I want her to ask me to work for her. Mm -hmm. That's my goal. (laughs) And so lo and behold, the last day I give my final presentation and you know, that is, I couldn't eat like the whole morning, nothing. Um, and we get the final presentation and I go outside of the room for my special debrief and it's her, Chris, and I forget who else was there. And she sits me down and I'm thinking, I did pretty good. Like I felt good about it. I was like, I think I nailed it. So I sit down and I'm like, <sighs> she's like, all right, so let's talk about this. Cause you've been really good. You've been a rock star up until now. Let's talk a little bit about your presentation. And I thought, Oh my God, it wasn't up to par. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. And she goes, listen, there's one question I need to ask you. And I'm like, what? Can you come work for me? And I about just fell out of my chair. Mm -hmm. I was like, are you you serious? And Chris is laughing, she's laughing by now. I'm like, no, like, is this a joke? Are you serious? I'm like, yes. Uh-huh. Yeah, I think she likes to do that. When I when she pulled me out for that little talk after my presentation, it was very similar. It's like, yeah, we need to talk about this. And she said, I just need to start out by saying, I would pay to see you speak. And the same thing, I almost fell off my chair because I was so nervous. And there was a man in my class, you, you, I'm sure you remember him, from California, um, who was already doing keynote speeches and public speaking. Wow. And... I was right behind him in my presentation. That's, that's hard. So I went into my presentation with this, oh my God, I can't believe I have to follow Rob. <laughs> oh, I remember Rob. I remember yes. Rob. Yes. yes. He was in both of my classes. We did the, the, the um, 101 he's class the and then the train the trainer. We did both of them together. And he's a good presenter. He's a good Yes. Speaker. Yeah. Right. And yeah. I followed him and I'm just like, like my throat was in my stomach the whole time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, and I know you and I have talked about uh, a little bit about how much we've learned about ourself yeah. from all of the training in body language in statement analysis in elicitation in micro expressions, um, even the um, eye accessing cues. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it really is. It has transformed. And I can't believe I even survived that first class, that 101 class, because I was at the height of my um, symptoms of complex post-traumatic stress when I took those classes. Wow. Um, I, I had gotten out of a relationship with somebody who was one of the most masterful, I would almost say pathological liars I've ever met in my life and kind of spiraled downward into, you know, traumatic stress after that relationship ended. And I um, told myself, I'm never going to let this happen to me again, which is when, why I sought out her classes and I found them and I'm like, Oh my God, I've read her books. Or, Or at the one time I'd only knew she had one book. I found out about the second one and signed up and Oh my gosh, so many tears. I was a basket case. <laughs> yeah. Well, I tell you, it's that you're in that, vulnerable state you know Mm -hmm. you know where you are and then um to allow people in to help you is one thing right that takes a lot of courage most Mm -hmm. people are like no I'll deal with it on my own I don't want help and number one I don't want it I don't want you to see how I truly feel right now and Mm -hmm. so we put this guard up so just the fact of us you know going to people and allowing someone to help us is huge I mean that's Mm -hmm. what happened to me too I allowed her to, okay, help me. You just, you just beat me down. I really don't feel like I can even teach a class again right now. I'm like, build me up. I'm ready. Yeah, you know? I went in already beaten down. So that was especially hard. <laughs> Gosh, wow. 
wow. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's tough because it, that yeah. course is very stressful. But mm-hmm. then you find out how you handle stress, how mm-hmm. you are under pressure and dealing with everything that's going on. Yeah. Yeah. So um, tell me a little bit about um, like what you've discovered about yourself and who you are from all of this training and what you teach now. So I'm going to say the biggest thing I took away from her class, the biggest is not to be afraid to say, I don't know, or I was wrong. Just never, ever be afraid because show me one human being on this planet who's always right and never been wrong. Mm-hmm. I don't think one exists. Right. right. And so, I can show you a lot who think they're always right and who they think, think they are. <laughs> they think they are, but nobody is. No one is. Yeah. Um, and just having that voice to stand behind what you do and what you say. Mm-hmm. So always, I call it being authentic, right? So yes. those are the two key, like the two main things I took away. Even when I teach today, I tell people, I'm like, listen, this is what I've done for decades. This is what I teach. Yes, I'm considered an expert. However, there's always room to learn. I'm still learning more about my trade crap every day. I force myself to. And um, don't be afraid to fail because I will tell you right now, of the hundreds of interrogations I've conducted, I wasn't always on target. I didn't always catch the lie. I didn't always get the truth. It was pretty close, but I didn't always. And so when you can start being honest with yourself, People around you tend to be honest. Yes. And when you can show your true colors, right, and be authentic, people around you trust you more and like you more. So now you're generating this energy of openness and honesty, and that's attracting people of the same caliber to come around you and be around you. So now you're attracting open and honest people. So I think it's like this ripple effect. But it has to start within you first. And I think that's the biggest takeaway I took from her is not being scared to say that you're wrong, not being scared to fail, right? And you don't have to know everything. And all of a sudden, you become very genuine and people know that you're sincere, authentic, genuine, and that attracts people. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, and I, I recently did your online elicitation course. And in the elicitation course, the, there's one aspect of that class that really, really impacted me more than others. Or, or was it elicitation or the ABCs? I forget which class it was in because I've done two of them now. Um, the, the part where you talk about biases. Oh, um, and that is that has been such a valuable learning tool for me about myself. And it was something that I've been aware of biases and breaking it down into the six different ones is something that I'd forgotten about. And it hadn't been in my awareness until I did that class recently. And I'm like, whoa, I needed to remind, I really needed this reminder, really needed it. My biggest hurdle is the halo and horns effect. Mm-hmm. because I will tend to, and I know when it's happening and I stop myself because because I'm mm-hmm. you know aware of it, but the biggest hurdle I have is when I do that first judgment and we're, we're going to judge people because it's evolutionary, mm-hmm. but all of a sudden I put a halo on you or horns. If you mm-hmm. look like something I don't like, you're bad. Mm-hmm. I don't know you. Why would I even, you know, think mm-hmm. that? Or right. if you look like me or sound like me or like the same things I do, I put a halo on your head and now I automatically trust you. I don't know who you are. Mm-hmm. Why would I trust you? Right? That's mm-hmm. a big one. And I, yeah. I struggled with that when I was younger. I didn't know what it was called. I didn't even know it was a bias. But now, you know, you can realize that you identify when it's happening and then you hit that pause button and clarify mm-hmm. your thoughts and start looking at things more objectively. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I love that you keep saying hit the pause button um, because I, I tell my clients and I say it all the time whenever I do Facebook lives or even on my show, practice the pause. Yes. When you notice something, practice the pause and, and go inside, um, you know, get introspective about what is happening. What's this about? Why am I assigning horns to this person or a halo to that person and, and start to dig deeper and, yeah, and that, that's been such a valuable lesson. Um, yeah, and really, I feel like all of it is teaching life skills, really just teaching basic life skills. Yeah, it is. Um, but when you're not taught it, and when somebody doesn't you know, describe it to you or relate it to you within a, a story, and you don't hear it, 
how can you identify it, mm-hmm. right? And so, so many people go through life and they have um, not so positive interpersonal communication skills and they don't know why. It's because no, they haven't identified it yet. So right. we did a lot of training about communication, leadership, um, biases, thought work, all this stuff. All of a sudden you're like, ha ha, that's why I tend to, and then fill in the blank. Mm-hmm. And now you can start to change those reactionary behaviors. But if you didn't know about them, you can't change them. Mm-hmm. Right, exactly. Exactly. And that's why um, the body language classes have really taught me so much about myself. Yeah. And uh, one of the things that I've learned in my trauma trainings, um, I did a year long class with Dr. Gabor Mate last year, and he is really masterful at teaching how to get beyond your perceptions, which is what Brene Brown said it calls the story you tell yourself. Because if you get wrapped up in the story you tell yourself, then you're not seeing the truth of the situation. And that story you tell yourself is all perception. And so being able to get beyond the perception to find out what is the truth that's underneath of it is so important. And I know in body language, it's not talked about in the same language. um, And it's also taught. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. When I'm training people to read body language, So especially when it comes to detecting deception, right? Mm -hmm. When I teach them to read, uh, to identify indicators of deception, I'm also training them to identify indicators of truthfulness. Mm -hmm. We need to be able to look for the truth. If we're only looking for deception, that's all we're ever going to see. And then everything that we see or hear, we're going to be like, aha, that's a lie. And it comes to that biased lens right? Um, or we have people that were talked to and somebody says, you know, I don't trust that person. I don't like that person. Well, now we're going to have a confirmation bias because when we talk to this person, we know that our friend doesn't like them or trust them. So now we're not going to trust them or like them. And again, perception and that lens that we see through it. I think it's super hard for the human brain to always remain objective. It, it is work. I mean, I have to work at it all the time. When I get into my interviews, even to this day, uh, it's like I, I hit the reset button as soon as I walk in the door. Okay, forget what you heard or all this other stuff. Just pay attention to this person. Get to know this person. Focus on your good questions. Focus on you know reading their body language. If they're stressed, if they're nervous, any indicators of truthfulness, and deception, all of that. Um, because it's a constant challenge not to be biased and not to have those perceptions. It's right. easy to overcome them, right? When, once you know how to, but if you don't know how to, they can totally cloud your judgment. Absolutely. And humans are, um, I, well, I learned this. I, I did a non-certifiable NLP class. So I'm not certified, even though I've studied NLP. Right. Um, I didn't go through one of the appropriate channels. And my NLP instructor used to say all the time, humans are meaning making machines. And we are, and that's the problem because we give meaning to everything and we are the worst at um, cause and effect, at being able to figure out an actual cause and an actual effect. So humans will see a correlation and automatically jump to causation and create a whole story around it. Oh, that's that's a problem. That is a problem. My husband. Always, that's all I hear from him. And I've been trying to be so much better. I can teach this stuff. I'm really good. But when it comes to my personal relationships, I'm not that great. It's, it's more work for me. But I hit the pause button. And instead of being reactionary and make up a story as to why he didn't do or do something, instead, I say, Lena, if you want to find out the information, all you got to do is ask them in a non-accusatory way. I tell people this all the time especially with texting, right? We get a text and we're like, uh, well, why didn't I get that three hours ago? Or really, you're only going to send me like one sentence? I expected a whole paragraph at least, right? Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So number one is getting rid of expectations on others. You can't have them. Mm-hmm. Just if we yeah. stop expecting people to do and say things, it's mm-hmm. going to make our lives a whole lot easier. Yes. Number two, don't make up the story. I tell people, and I train even my law enforcement and during interviews, right, with criminals, Don't make up a story. All you have to do is ask a person, right? So I tell people, don't tell a person what they did or why they did it. Ask them, what did you do? Why did you do it? Don't tell a person how they feel. You're only going to make a person go defensive. Mm -hmm. I would never say, uh, you know, Jennifer, you look pretty angry today. 
why would I say that? Instead, I just ask a question, Jennifer, how are you feeling today? Mm-hmm. And I can't go into yeah. inter- interrogations with, well, you look pretty, you know, whatever, angry, pissed off, or uh, pretty happy about what you did. No. Yeah. How are you feeling right now? Right. But when yes. we start to make up the story, have the perceptions, assign, you know, tell people what they did, why they did it, and how they feel, oof. It's just not a good recipe. Right, right. And I love um, in in the classes, you say it, Janine says it, um, you know, I've heard Chris say it, it's not about mind reading. And I think that's where people um, go wrong. Like even even here in Ohio, we were having um, our governor is Mike DeWine. And so he, we were having wine with DeWine every day at two o'clock whenever we would go into co- when we went into COVID for the press releases. That's what we called it, wine with DeWine. And I would, and I had to turn off the comments because somebody kept commenting and, and I, I was tempted to go off on her and I'm like, no, just let it go, Jen. Just turn the chat off because she said, oh, it, when uh, Dr. Acton would come on and give her updates, she would, this one woman would really kick in with, oh, she looked to the side. She's lying. Look at her eyes. And, and I'm like, no, <laughs> it's not, it's like, I don't know what you're talking about. You don't, you don't know how to read body language. If you really want to see hot spots and red flags, let's go back to the, um, some of the other um, conspiracy theory COVID related videos that were going around. Yeah. I watched a couple of those and uh, there were so many hot spots, so many tells that I, do I know 100% for sure whether they were lying or not? Um, No, I don't. I wasn't in the room to ask them questions, but there were so many red flags, so many, so much convincing and conveying language, so much um, power over language, like you better believe me and like the emperor's new clothes. If you don't believe me, you're a fool, you know, type of thing. And, um, and those type of tactics are all red flags. And I'm like, so I've discerned that I don't believe it. And oh my gosh, the attacks I got because I discerned that I didn't believe it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the unfortunate thing, for some reason today, you can't have an opinion because there's going to be somebody that just don't, doesn't like it and is going to mm-hmm. want to attack you, right? Right. Verbally attack. Um, and it's bad. You know, I when I posted a few things on Facebook one time, oh my gosh, I spun up people. Um so when I was traveling back um, from Georgia to Norfolk during the two-week voyage, I was venting because COVID just started and it was this brand new thing. And uh, the governor of one of the states decided to close all the marinas. So that means no fuel, no water. Uh, I can't pump out. I'm like, um, I need access to a marina. Like I'm two weeks, you know, on this voyage. And so I vented on social media and I shouldn't have done that because that's just never a good thing. Um, I will never do it again. Um, and I just said, you know, how could they make a decision like this? Because it affects all voters who are now doing this big, because in March, a lot of voters go from Florida back up to, you know, Maine and wherever. And so one of, uh, someone on my Facebook posted, she goes, you know, oh, grow up, Alina. And I thought, wow. And immediately I felt that fine. I was so angry and I wanted to retaliate back, but I thought, why? There's no use. I don't know her. She doesn't know me. Um, and why would I let the stranger, you know, make me so upset? So I politely just replied, you know, Anne, I know you're more respectful than that. And I appreciate you being respectful to me and everybody else on this thread. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And I never heard from her again. Yeah. But it's, um, it's having that inner strength to not be, again, reactionary, to pause, mm-hmm. to think about it, and to say something good. But it's, it's definitely... Yeah. Um, but anyway, it was going back to my story right now with COVID and of course, you know, what just happened in the news with the cop, Oof, people are just very mm-hmm. um, on edge. Yeah. Yeah. And I, one of the things I teach is, and, and that I talk about a lot is our, our different power centers. Um, a lot of different traditions will talk about chakras. I don't like chakras because I see power centers a little bit different from chakras. And when we go into survival mode, I also um, study archetypes uh, yeah. and learning because the, the language of the soul or the language of the divine or the unconscious is absolutely symbolism and archetypes are symbolism. So it's giving me a better understanding of myself. And one of my teachers that I learned from um, talks about 
Um, you know, if you imagine yourself or your spiritual self as a building, um, if you're on the first floor, the second floor, the third floor, you know, the, the ground floor, you see the street and you see across the street or you look down and you see to the end of the block or, you know, as far as you can see, but you go up a level and you have a different perspective. So if that first floor is our first power center, um, the second floor is the second power center, the third floor, and those first three floors are where we really get into our tribal thinking and we get into our survival mode. And at, so many people have just shoop, right down into their survival mode. Um, and the archetypes that come out in our survival mode, our survival family, is the victim, the saboteur, the prostitute, um, and oh my gosh, victim, child, the inner child. Um, and so those are the survival family of archetypes. And man, am I seeing that everywhere. And yeah. people going back into their tribal thinking. And when I say tribal thinking, it's not about um, Native American tribes or yeah. actual tribes or tribal land. It's, it's, a, it's group think. It's the hive mind. And tribes are all about, so say at the tribe, you have to think the same way as the tribe or you're going to be cast out. And yes. yeah. there are... And that goes back to our, our primal beliefs. Like if we're cast out of the tribe, that's our survival. So it brings up that fear, subconscious fear. It's not in our conscious awareness. And once you get above that third floor and you start to see from some of the higher perspectives and you get the big picture and you can see from that 360 view on the top floor or on the, the roof, then it's really hard to crash back down into those lower floors. And with COVID and the whole um, police killing of George Floyd, I was there for about a week and I was able to pull myself back up and I'm like, oh man, some of the stuff I said and did, <laughs> you know, I can't take it back. And now it's okay, stay up here, rise above it and move on because there's a lot of bickering and looking back. And, and my whole attitude is, okay, what's happened has happened. How can we reformulate things to move forward? I am all on board with restructuring things moving forward, but with the bickering about looking back, I'm having a hard time staying in that. Yep. Oh, I agree. It's very hard to um, be in the present, right? And that's all mindfulness too. Yes. So with mindfulness, it's really focusing right now. If we're too worried about the future and we're dwelling on the past we're not right here and we're missing everything that's happening right now and we're not going to make the wise decisions because we're one focused on the future worried on the past right mm -hmm. um huge in communication and whenever i'm teaching a body language class a interrogation class a detecting deception class solicitation i always start off every single class with awareness and I have awareness check tests I make people check their level of awareness self and situational and that is a part of it the biases the perceptions the assumptions the being fully present all of that needs to be in check before you can go on to learn anything about body language or anything about um, you know interviewing or detecting deception you have to clear your mind of clutter and allow it to open up, I call opening the aperture, so you can be more aware, an objective awareness. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I love that you do the awareness um, aspect of your classes, because I'm one of those um, woo-woo people on one aspect of who I am, um, who believes that we have more than just five senses. The five senses that we learn about in school are our tactile, like 3D senses for this world. Um, that, you know, like sound and sight are like distance senses. Everything else has to be, you know, you know, and smells a little bit of a distance, but everything else has to be closer. Mm -hmm. And we also have other senses that we don't learn about. We have our instinctual sense. We mm -hmm. have our intuitive sense, which are different. Mm -hmm. We have our emotional sense. We have our spiritual senses about us. And awareness, the awareness is the way you, in the way that you teach it is what helps us get in touch with those senses that we don't really know how to talk about, but we know we have. Yeah. Yeah. And they're also important in building, um, in, in the trauma classes that I do, we call it safety attunement and rapport. Now I've heard you use rapport, but safety and attunement is really important because if the person you're talking to doesn't feel safe, I'm like, yes, yeah. they are not going to tell you the truth and they're not going to want to talk to you. They're going to completely close off. Yeah. And it's funny because one of my um, techniques 
is to create a safe environment. That's what my whole method of interviewing comes from, is creating that safe environment. So number one, you can make that person or convince that person to feel comfortable. And when they feel comfortable, they're gonna to start to trust you. When you gain their trust, now the truthful information comes because they're gonna to start to open up. But if that person does not feel safe, you're not gonna get anywhere. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You're more likely if the person doesn't feel safe, you're more likely to get what's called the fawn response than you are actual honesty. And the fawn response is not well understood yet in the larger um, society. Um, we, we know about fight, flight or freeze. Um, fight and flight are sympathetic activation. Freeze is a little bit different. People like to lump the three together, but physiologically what's happening in the body is a little bit different than just sympathetic activation. Um, and then there's the fawn response, which is when, um, let's say a woman is being um, attacked or you know, in the, the process of being sexually assaulted. Uh, a lot of times that's an inescapable attack. And if it's an inescapable attack, fighting's not gonna work. Freezing isn't, you know, freezing or tonic immobility, you know, fighting and fleeing are not options. Freezing, that can be an option. Fawn is the other option where women sometimes will say things that are held against them in court, like, oh yes, I like that. Um, please keep doing that. It's a negotiation for our life. Mm -hmm. And I don't, that's where, one thing where I see a little bit of a gap in the process. I don't think a lot of interrogators are trained and it's something that's relatively new and I think it's important to train them. So how do you know if the person you're talking to is being deceptive like an Amy Cooper or in the fawn response and they're saying what they need to say because all they want to do is get out of the situation where they feel their life is in danger. False confessions. So I yes. go through a whole um, mm -hmm. uh, a segment about how to avoid false confessions, and that's it right there. I mean, there's so many times people falsely confess, and other people are like, well, that's just incredible. I can't believe someone would say they would kill someone just because uh, they were tired or whatever. No, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a legit thing. Mm -hmm. um, the Innocence Project, right, has proven so many yes. people that were innocent um, through DNA testing because, mm -hmm. or, um, who may have falsely confessed or wrongfully convicted. Mm -hmm. So that's a huge thing to mm -hmm. identify. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, and, and it's really important because if we can recognize it in ourselves, yeah. it's so much easier to recognize in another person. And it's whenever we only recognize things in other people that it becomes judgments rather than um, connection. Yes, because we haven't done it, so we don't mm -hmm. know. Yeah. Oh, it makes total sense. Total yeah. Sense. Yes. And, again, and that, when I go through my classes, it's so huge to remain objective. And I try to tell people as best, it, it's going to be so much work, but you cannot be subjective about anything. You can't judge. You can't have the biases, the expectations. You can't have assumptions. You can't make up a story because all of that clouds what really is there. That mm -hmm. truthful information that you are seeking, the intent, the motivations, the, everything behind it, you will never get if all of that junk is right here through that filter. Mm -hmm. Not exactly. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I'm curious, as you were learning all of these techniques, what were your biggest challenges? Like, what were the, what were the things where you're like, I just can't do this? Because I think all of us who are considered specialists or experts in something, we go through that. You're like, oh my God, I can't do this. It's like the, you know, on the hero's journey, it's the resistance to the call. What was yeah. yours? Yeah, yeah. Oh my <laughs> gosh. Um, what was it? I'm trying to think. You know, that's a difficult question. I don't know how to answer that. I will tell you that the more I get into the psychology behind um, interviewing, um, the more I get into uh, you know, the sociopaths and dealing with pathological liars, dealing with people who are experiencing trauma. The more I find out, the more I don't know. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm teaching this class, but I don't know how to use uh, specific techniques with people who are experiencing trauma. I don't know this. Even talking to you, I'm like, wow, that's one nugget that I haven't mastered yet. Can I master? Can I learn enough about it to incorporate all this stuff in? So interviewing, especially in my classes, it's, it is a method that I have, but there's so much more information still coming in out there. So I think 
that's what I haven't mastered. There's mm -hmm. more I can bring to the table. There's more I need to learn to mm -hmm. arm, especially law enforcement that I'm teaching, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that is, it, it worries me. Um, but yeah, I guess that would be my biggest hurdle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yep. Yeah. And I, I remember um, when I took your elicitation class, I remember thinking to myself, wow, I think I've been doing elicitation my whole life, especially the provocative statements. Yeah. Only where I recognize it in myself when I look back is, wow, I used it to manipulate. And, mm -hmm. um, and I, I got to a point where I realized that, because uh, I, I grew up with a lot of abuse in my childhood household. And so I learned at a very young age how to be like my parents, which was manipulative, passive aggressive, you know, rageful outbursts. I learned all of that from a very young age. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So manipulation became part of who I was when I came into adulthood. And I can, and when it, when it came to my attention, you know, that was part of my bottoming out in my, you know, complex post-traumatic stress was realizing, oh my gosh, I am all these things that I abhor in people. Yeah. And I embody that. And how can I get that out of me? So I don't do this anymore. And I can start to like the person that I am. Mm -hmm. And so the, I've had a little bit of a challenge with the provocative statements in realizing that, oh, wow, I do that. And I need to turn it around and use it for something positive rather than manipulation, which I used to do in my 20s and 30s. Yeah. That, yes. Yep. Very interesting. Yeah. And I don't know that I would have, um, and I, I think I was already on the path to change that pattern in myself. And I don't know that I would have fully come to the conscious awareness had I not eventually taken your class in elicitation yeah, because right. it really brought it to the forefront of my awareness. Whereas yeah. in the, it was just in the background and I hadn't quite put two and two together yet. So, Very cool. Very so cool. It, it's just amazing how all of this work where I think in our minds as the public, you know, we hear about interrogators and we're like, oh, I know, you know, like from what we see on TV and the good cop, bad cop and slamming your fist on the table and, you know, Hollywood, it right? Work, it shouldn't work. I will say that I was trained in that and called it Mutt and Jeff. It's ridiculous. Um, it is Hollywood TV. If you real life, you should not be doing that. Mm hmm. Yeah, I just, it's not an approach that I back or that I use because, um, again, I'm all about creating a safe environment. That does not create a, a safe environment. Does right. Not. right. And um, now, and I also understand, too, that there are just er average everyday people like you and me who lie, but then there's this other category of powerful liars. Mm -hmm. And so I have never um, interviewed a powerful liar, to my knowledge. Uh, so what's the difference in your approach? How do you, because I imagine that there has to be a difference in approach if you're going to get a powerful liar, to be honest. I typically, because powerful liar does not mean you're good at lying. It doesn't. It just means that you don't care about lying, right? So, um, you're not going to get stressed out and nervous because instead of worried about the lie and the consequences, you just focus on the reward of the lie. So there's no stress going through your body. So nothing's been triggered. Your stress uh, response system hasn't been triggered. Cortisol is not going up. I can't see here any physiological responses to stress. So that's that key ingredient that I'm missing. My regular liars, it's easy, right, to read because you're already stressing out right in front of me. You're falling apart. And pretty soon it's going to affect your cognitive ability and then everything's just going to unravel and you're going to give up, right, because it's too much stress and pressure. So powerful liars don't have that same amount of stress and anxiety because they're just focused on, you know what, if I get away with this lie, I don't go to jail, I get more money, I get the job I wanted, I get to hurt this person I don't like, whatever it is, that's what they're focused on. Mm -hmm. um, but you can still catch them in lies because they're not good at lying. So even though I may not be seeing the physiological responses to stress or picking up on some nonverbal indicators, your words will dime you out every single time. So I do statement analysis. I pay attention to every word that people tell me. And as you're speaking to me, I shut my internal voice off and I pay attention only to what you're saying. And I analyze everything. And within your words, you will leak indicators of deception. And at that point, I can't just come out and say, ha ha, you're lying. At that point, with a powerful liar, because usually a powerful liar is they want to talk and they want to talk about 
whatever they want to talk about, not the lie. And they want to convince you and they're going to be overly polite and, you know, all of that. So I feed their ego. I feed their ego and um, I use a little bit of the flattery and naivete elicitation techniques with them. Mm -hmm. And I don't ask any questions. It's all just narrative statements. And I'm guiding the conversation unbeknownst to them, but I'm guiding it and I'm transitioning through it. And eventually I'm going to lead you to the part that I think is a lie. And now I'm going to ask for those details and a whole bunch of other techniques that I have to start to unravel the whole entire story. And at some point I'm going to present that to you in a very respectful way, but I present it to that powerful liar. Mm -hmm. I had a lot, when I worked on the TV show for three years on Couples Court, mm -hmm. a lot of my litigants, powerful liars. I, nobody's going to catch me in my lie. I've been doing this for 10 years. You know, I'm too good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And you just, mm -hmm. I feed their ego. I become their best mm -hmm. friend. I use, I exploit the similar to me bias. And so they like me more, they trust me more. And then they just start talking, talking, and then oops, accidentally say something they shouldn't. And now I gotcha. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. And statement analysis uh, has been incredibly, incredibly valuable. Um, oh my gosh. Oh, life, I, life I, changing. Yeah. Yep. Statement analysis is one of my favorite things. I absolutely love it. It's so accurate, in my opinion. It's so accurate in detecting deception um, because there's people think about their body language. You know, when you're lying, you're like, oh, I have to control my body language. I can't do this. I have to look at them. And people think, oh, I'm pretty normal. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm so normal. I'll just normal. Sit here. <laughs> So I'm like, okay, well, you can try to control your body language, but what people don't try to control is their words. Mm -hmm. So now they may try to control what they say, but the words, they don't think about controlling. And it's mm -hmm. the words where your lie comes out. Right, right. And that was something that was, that was hard for me to get my head around yeah. um, at first when I first did that um, online class and statement analysis. That was hard for me to get my head around because I'm like, well, wait a minute, what's... I don't see what's wrong here. <laughs> yeah, and and yeah. now I can go back, you know, a few years later and look at all of the material from that class and go, oh, yeah, I can see what was wrong. So there. clear right now, right? Yeah, it's a lot more clear. So it takes practice. And I didn't realize how much I actually retained from that class because I walked away feeling like a complete failure. And every passing month or every passing year, it really retains and kind of grows. So I, I may go back and repeat that one again. It does. Uh, very cool. And um, I tell you what, so it, you have to baseline, right? So even mm -hmm. with the body language, you read body language, mm -hmm. you still have to baseline on the verbal indicators because I need to know your rate of speech. I need to know what your pet words are because like one indicator is when a person tries to convince you and instead of saying no, they say never, right? It's a convincing, uh, convincing technique. Mm -hmm. The problem is sometimes people say never just because they say never. I'm one of those people. Never mm -hmm. is my baseline work. I say it for everything. So you mm -hmm. can't use that one for me, you know? So as you're, you know, baselining a person just for a few minutes, get a feel for how they sound, their rate of speech, their pitch of their voice, and the pet words or terminology that they tend to use. Mm -hmm. There was this one video. I did a podcast um, a couple weeks ago, and I was to assess two videos, and there was this one kid – guy he was accused of killing somebody and they were questioning him and he kept answering every single question no never no never no never now to us right that's a convincing technique but that was his baseline he'd ask you know pertinent questions no never or answer and answer non-pertinent questions no never so i had to toss that one out i'm like nope go on to the next one you know what else do i see in here Right. And I think that's a really, really big thing that um, amateurs overlook. Yeah. Uh, because I remember I read Janine's book years before I took her class. And when I read her book, you know, I, I was one of those people who came away from it, you know, thinking just from a couple things I really retained and learned from it that I could detect deception from it. Yeah. And oh, man, was I wrong. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's... Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a lot. It's a big learning curve because there's a lot of information. Mm -hmm. and you're constantly having to baseline and analyze, baseline and analyze. But then the more effort and more times you do it and the more work you put into it, it becomes second nature. It mm -hmm. really does. 
Yeah, it does. That's what I've discovered too, is it really does become second nature. Yeah. So, yeah. So uh, tell us a little bit about, um, tell our listeners where they can find you. Um, I highly recommend her online classes. Um, so, and where you can find your online classes. So it's a website. I host all my online training through Thinkific. So it's TCG. So Tango Charlie Golf, um, which stands for my company name, the Congruence Group, tcg.thinkific.com. And there's four courses up there right now. I have an elicitation train the trainer. I have an introductory elicitation course. I have the ABCs of human interaction, awareness, body language, and communication. And then I have um, a quick one-hour course on resolving conflict. Um, coming soon is going to be my rebel program, which is going to be a seven week course. And that brings you everything from, um, establishing rapport to baselining to nonverbal and verbal to questioning techniques, all of that. So it's what my first book is about, the Your Lying book. Okay. And then I'm going to have a course just on statement analysis analysis and verbal indicators, and then just on body language. So three courses coming up hopefully this summer. I don't have awesome. to do that, but that they're in the works. Okay, wonderful. Well, I can't wait for the statement analysis because the the only one I've done in the past was Mark McClish's. And, so you know, he's Godfather, right? He created yeah. analysis. He's amazing. Right. Um, it's something I would rather do a good statement analysis at night than watch a movie. I love it that much. I do it 24 seven. Um, I've done it on all my litigants and all my interviews, all my interrogations. Um, people ask me to go through stuff. I just love it. So yeah, I've been watching our updates from our mayor uh, in the last week and I'm like, just do, doing statement analysis as he, as he talks and everyone's like, Oh, this sounds great. This sounds great. And I'm like, wait, what the hell does he mean by a meaningful civilian committee? Does meaningful mean they're going to have authority to do anything and right. saying that, you know, we may require concessions from the Ohio, Ohio FOP. What does may require mean? What about absolutely require? Mm -hmm. I'm like, he's weaselly. Like, come on, people. He's weaselly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, you know, just on those words. Right. Those right. little words make a really, really big deal. Like, he's not saying what meaningful means, but he keeps saying meaningful civilian committee, which to me just sounds shady. Yeah. Well, I tell you, the one indicator, and I'll share this with the listeners, number one indicator is so accurate. When people stop dropping off personal uh, pronouns, right, I and my, and they mm -hmm. start replacing them with every other pronoun, us, we, they, you, them, doesn't mm -hmm. matter. That means somebody doesn't want to take accountability for what they're saying. So if you think back right. to Anthony Weiner's scandal back in the day, yep. whenever he was asked about, Anthony, did you send the tweet? First of all, he could never say no. He never mm -hmm. ever could say no. So that's indicator number one. The two mm -hmm. person would say, no, I didn't send it. But you're done. So number one, he can't say no because he doesn't want to commit to a lie. People hate lying. I know people mm -hmm. are like, there's no way. I know people love to lie. Now, inherently, human beings don't like to lie. So nobody wants to commit to a lie. But the second thing is nobody wants to take any responsibility for the lie. Mm -hmm. So it's all of a sudden we're trying to figure out who sent it. Well, we're working out. Well, when mm -hmm. you find out, right? Not, it's never, I'm trying to figure out who sent it. Yes. But he sent it. He knows this, right? Mm -hmm. so whenever I stop hearing I and my, mm -hmm. my ears perk right up. Yeah, that distancing language. He's using distancing language too in his speeches. And I'm just like, I don't believe him. Don't believe a yeah. word he says. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there, there's already a petition around Columbus with more than enough names, um, you know, requesting that he resign and he won't even pay attention to it. So, no, unfortunately, I, I don't yeah. know who this individual is, but I yeah. try. I don't, I should probably watch more news, um, but it's mm. just so depressing these days that it's, it comes on and it makes me feel anxiety and I don't want to feel that way. Yeah, and it's hard. I notice it because I live here in Columbus and we have a, a troubled history with CPD and um, excessive force and brutality. We yeah. have a pretty bad history in Ohio. Wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. The top 10, yeah. out of the top 10, three worst cities, we've got three of them, Cincinnati, Columbus, and Cleveland. Oh, wow. You know, on wow. per capita, per capita killings of people of color. Wow. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Columbus is number one, last I heard. <laughs> if, if that statistic is correct, um, that I'm not sure of, because I haven't fact checked the statistic I saw the other day. And I need to go do that. But if that's true, Columbus is number one. So yeah, we have issues. Wow. 
Yeah. And so, and I can imagine it would be really hard to keep up with every news outlet in the nation <laughs> with what's happening right now. It's, but I've, I've been pay attention, paying attention locally and it's, it's yeah. troubling. I try to plug into my local mm -hmm. news just so I'm not ignorant because that's no way to be either. I want to know mm -hmm. what's going on, but when it just gets into um, people just wanting to vent, that's when I'm like, okay, I'm mm -hmm. you know, give me the facts. I want to hear the facts. I don't yeah. care about anything else other than that. You know? Yes. Yeah. And I miss the news that was just the facts. Okay. <laughs> I really miss that news. That was like when I was a little kid. I think I heard... I want to say I heard it um, on our local news station. It was uh, last Friday. Hey, a good a good news story Friday or something like that. I'm like, wow, that's sad that we have to designate one day for something good. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm thinking, oh, yeah, it's just depressing. It is. It is. I have a hard time watching the news, too. And it's so scripted. I read it. I don't watch it anymore. Yeah. yeah. I don't like, I, I'd rather put my own tone of voice <laughs> into what I'm reading rather yeah. than have that chosen for me anymore. I was, um, I got, when I was down in Gitmo interrogating and mm -hmm. I left there, it was down there in between 2002 and three. And I'll never forget this. We, it was September 11th, um, a year, it was yeah, a year after 9-11. And we all gathered at 7 a.m. in the morning at the flagpole on CDC Hill, it was called. And we we're having a memorial, you know, um, for um, service for 9-11, a year behind. So we're all in formation. We have a moment of silence. and Not a memorial, just a moment of silence. And the news reporters from Time Magazine and a couple other, um, I can't remember exactly who, but news reporters on the island, and they took pictures of us. And they reported it that we were gathering, and this is the craziest thing, it just it makes, still makes me mad today, that we were gathering to discuss secret interrogation techniques on the detainees. Um, no, we were gathering for a moment of silence to honor everybody who died in 9-11. Everybody, you know? And so when I was down there and I would read about all of this stuff, which were complete lies, at that point I was like, I'm not watching the news. Like, how can I watch it when I know they just support a blatant lie? And even when I got subpoenaed seven years later and I had to go down for the first um, military war tribunals and I was a prosecution witness for a very couple of famous detainees um, that were going on right down there, I was reported by all the news reporters in the back room as saying things I never said. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I was like, done. Mm -hmm. uh, and... And I knew this because yeah. I was there. But look at all the millions of people who believe the news coming in that are that are blatant lies, and but they don't know any better. You know where they're going to get their information? They don't know any better. They can't get the information anywhere else. They weren't there, so all we have to go by is the news. Mm -hmm. It's a sad place. And I'm not saying yeah. every news outlet does this. Of course not. But just what I experienced those years ago, that multiple media outlets supported blatant lies mm -hmm. how do they get away with that yeah and and they do and they have for a really long time it's yeah. it's terrifying it's absolutely terrifying i don't know many people who have been interviewed or had encounters with news media newspapers who haven't walked away going yeah that's not exactly what i said they distorted or they took out of context or you know they they left a really important part of the conversation out and they only reported half of the conversation mm -hmm. to skew it you know for certain spin and yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah and that that's important to keep in our mind and how quickly we forget when we see that story right yeah. <laughs> I tell people, listen, and I hope this is okay for your podcast, but sex sells. Mm -hmm, it does. People want, they want something sexy. Mm -hmm. They want violence. They want something that's going to stir up emotions. They want something. Uh, and do they crave that, um, that reaction to yeah. it? Uh, and that can, I don't know if you've ever, I have a, a friend, she's a life coach, and she talks about how our um, chemicals in our body, when they release during certain things, that we actually crave stress. Mm -hmm. And I don't know enough science behind it, um, but it sounds completely plausible. And so mm -hmm. if we're craving stress, then we're craving something negative. You know, mm -hmm. we're craving something that's going right. to get us out from the news. And then yeah. you get people watching it, and you get higher ratings, and 
Well, there you go. Yeah, there's a sense, uh, we don't, the average person, when I say we, the average person um, isn't well educated in this. There's a such thing as a behavioral addiction and most people aren't aware of behavioral addiction. So chronic complaining, chronic gossiping, um, those are forms of um, behavioral addictions and people don't realize it. And we also get addicted to um, certain illusions and perceptions. And I believe that we have been addicted to this illusion of stability in, um, in, in the world around us. And I think that we, since COVID started, I think we are seeing a collective withdrawal because it very much is the, the emotional chaos that people go through whenever they withdraw from any type of addiction. Not the same thing as substance because you don't have the physical reactions and the sweating and the vomiting and all of that. However, there is a withdrawal process. And I think we are all going through the withdrawal of addiction to the illusion of security and safety in the world around us and stability and constancy. Because we know logically that life can change in the blink of an eye. And when it really happens, look at the resistance and the disbelief to it. Mm -hmm. And yet, it's happened. Yeah. It, you know, it's happened this year with the economy. It's happened this year with COVID. It's happened this year with, you know, the, the Black Lives Movement or Black Lives Matters Movement. And um, so all of this stuff is changing in the blink of an eye for a lot of people. Now, there are a lot of people where, uh, you know, the, the last one, the Black Lives Matters Movement hasn't changed fast enough. For a lot of other people who are just initially waking up to it, yeah, this is life-changing in the blink of an eye. So two vastly different perceptions, and how do we balance that out? Because two totally different experiences right now in the world. And, yeah. and multiples in between. It's not just limited to two. And when you don't understand it, you can get frustrated over that and just causes more anxiety. Exactly, exactly. Reaction, reaction, yep, reaction mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, so I hope some of the listeners out there like get, get their interest peaked and do some of your classes because it really is life changing. And not only does it give you better skills to communicate and have relationship with anybody, um, it also gives you a much deeper understanding about yourself. And that, that is priceless, absolutely priceless. Yeah, it's a journey in self-discovery, as I call it. Yeah. And absolutely. it never ends. The journey never ends. <laughs> yes. And I'll make sure that I put links up to your website and where people can find you. Um, you know, and I know you've got the contact form on your website, so people will be able to get in touch with you if they need to. Yeah. Um, Lena, before we uh, wrap up the recording today, do you have any final tips or techniques to leave with our listeners? I would just want to tell everyone to trust yourself, be patient with yourself. You're only human. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to say and do things that you didn't intend to or you shouldn't have. But as long as every day you keep working to be that better human being, then you're in the right place. And a lot of that comes with, um, you know, having courage to go out and seek advice from other people, uh, learn more about yourselves, take some training that you never thought you could, do something that you never thought you could. Because in all of that, you just keep growing as a human. And I just think that's the most critical thing that we can focus on. Uh, brilliant. Thank you so much, Lena. It's really been an honor to have you on the show today. Thank you. And I love seeing you again. Oh, I love seeing you too. Thanks again. All right. Take care. <laughs> take care. And for all of our listeners out there, um, please look me up. Um, you can find me uh, on Spotify. You can find me on iHeartRadio. I'm on Apple Podcasts. Please listen, subscribe, um, and join the show. And if you found this information helpful, please share it with others um, because that's how you can change the world is sharing valuable information that can help people improve themselves, improve their lives, and that has a spillover effect and it improves the lives of others in the process. Have a great day, everyone, and I will see you all next week. We have just concluded another episode of the Yes And podcast with Jennifer Whitaker. For additional resources, please visit our website, jenniferwhitaker.com. Leave a review if you enjoyed the show and find it useful. Until next time, continue challenging conventional thinking and keep moving forward.